behalf of the Agora team, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this new iteration of the Agora talk. Tonight we have Lilia Siamu with us and she will speak about digital identities and our bones. And to moderate this evening, I'm very glad to introduce you to Katie Yu. Katie is a London-based creator whose research focuses on new media, diasporas, and socially engaged practices. She holds a BA in contemporary art and socially engaged practices from New York University. And she has a MFA in curating from Goldsmiths University of London. Katie has curated exhibitions and events at ICA London, Cubit Gallery, The Yard Theatre, Enclave Lab, APT Galleries, and Corsica Studios. Her most recent project, Phantom Slim, was an arts council-funded exhibition and event series featuring Korean diaspora artists at Kodidok in East London. And now Katie is uh, working at Tate. So I'm happy to hand it over to you, Katie. Thank you, Mimi. And um, hi, everyone. It's so lovely to see so many uh, familiar names here as well as some new, new visitors. Thank you so much for joining us for this special iteration of Agora's Talks program. And I'm so delighted to have the pleasure of speaking with New York-based multimedia artist Lilia Ziamu. Lilia's practice has been strongly informed by her research into innovation, technology, and design, and the potential of technologies to create new digital identities. Uh, Lilia is from Greece, so growing up surrounded by um, classical ruins has instilled her with an interest in fragmented bodies and how uh, this gives the body, particularly the female body, the potential to break free from conventional forms and existing categories to create new associations. Lilia describes her work as combining classical and digital techniques. She has created sculptures, photographs, clothing, and digital drawing to use. She uses an incredible range of materials and techniques in her studio in Brooklyn. Some of her source fragments come from art history references, her own body, anatomical models, mannequins, and even previous sculptures. She also uses 3D modeling and digital fabrication techniques to manipulate those fragments and tra transforms them into new entities using materials such as marble, alabaster, thermoplastic, cement, wax, textiles uh, that she designs by herself by hand. It's really incredible the um, different materials she uses. So the resulting composite Portraits possess both a sense of materiality and fantasy, and they're filled with evocations of the female body. Her recent work was presented in a solo exhibition last year, Body Politic, at NYU Kimmel Galleries. And other additional solo exhibitions have been held at Elga Wimmer, Henry Gallery, John Jay College Gallery, uh, the Consulate General of Greece in New York, and Gallery 7 in Athens. Lilia was also artist in residence at the Museum of Art and Design in 2014 and holds a PhD from the University of Rhode Island. And now she currently teaches at the City University of New York. So for this talk, which is entitled Digital Bodies as Narrative, Lilia will share some insight into her artistic practice, uh, one of her recent body series of work, as well as a new body of work she's currently working on. She'll discuss a little bit as well. So she wants to get us all thinking about how digital representations of the body and therefore digital identities can be conceived and presented as a narrative and hopes to get us all kind of thinking about this topic. And we'll have opportunities later up to open up for questions and further discussions around this at, on our tables later on. Um, but when we get to the Q&A session after Lilia's talk. So thank you, Lilia, for joining us. And I'll hand it over to you now. So hello everyone, it's snowing right now in New York for those of you who are not here. Thank you, you me for the opportunity to share my work. It's been a pleasure to work with you and Katie. And again, thank you all for joining us today. I'm very excited to be here in this uh, virtual platform. Just like the Agora in uh, ancient Greece, it's a place of uh, gathering and conversation. And it has been uh, very inspiring for me uh, the last few months to follow the program. So today, the topic of our uh, conversation is digital bodies as narratives. 
And um, I will be structuring the, uh, my talk around uh, three parts. The what, which refers to what I do in my art practice. Uh, there are multiple layers in every artist's practice. So for today's conversation, I will focus on those aspects of my practice that refer to the digital body. I will also speak about the so what, why the digital body matters and why should we care about it. And finally, I will conclude with the now what uh, that refers to the implications of technology, uh, what happens when technology intersects with the body in the context of identity creation. So I will start with the so what, why the digital body matters. We are all every day constructing ourselves online, even multiple times a day, especially now with the pandemic. So we have social media during uh, Zoom meetings or virtual events. Technology enables us to do that. And in this process, I believe we try uh, variations of ourselves. So we are constructing and uh, reconstructing our online self and we're sharing our body with, in various online environments and communities. And in this sharing process, the physical body becomes very important because it becomes a digital body. And because of this transformation, because it's being transformed, we're being transformed from our physical self to a digital self, there are many interesting questions that come up. The first one that I found very intriguing is what is the relationship between our physical body and the way we experience our physical body and our digital body that we present online? And how do we experience this relationship? Do we like it? Do we don't like it? Uh, are we getting stressed about it? Do we prefer it to our physical presence? What is uh, real and what is not? How do we feel about the multiple identities that we construct when we present ourselves online? Uh, how do we feel with the fact that we may have to change very quickly? For example, we are in a Zoom meeting and at the time, at the same time, we may be posting on Instagram. Uh, so these are different selves that we construct and we present uh, very often simultaneously in these various online communities. And last but not least, how do we feel about others' online identities? How do we feel when we see our friends presenting themselves online? And how do we feel when we know people only online and we never really met them physically? So these are the questions that I found very intriguing and the questions that have been informing my practice for some time. And uh, what underlines these uh, questions is the fact that our identities are increasingly fragmented online and that we all have to make sense of these fragments. So I will now tell you a bit about my practice that Cathy summarized very well. She got a very good understanding of my practice in such a short uh, period of time. So what I do, as you know, is that my practice focuses on the body, on the fragmented body. I do combine classical techniques and emerging technologies, digital practices to manipulate fragments. And uh, what I make are basically entities that liberate the body from conventional meanings, conventional forms and expectations. In terms of what I make more specifically is I create sculptures, clothing, public artworks, photographs, uh, drawings, and they all evoke fragmented bodies. In terms of my sources, my source fragments, I have been using in the past my own body, my earlier sculptures, anatomical models, mannequins, and fragments from art history. I've been working with a variety of media going back between the physical and the digital constantly. I've been carving stone by hand, marble, alabaster, uh, working with modeling clay and casting in cement. Uh, the last few years, I've been working a lot with thermoplastics, manipulating them by hand. What I also do uh, in the digital component of my work is that I use digital techniques such as 3D scanning and image manipulation to transform these fragments. So in my works, I attempt to merge materiality and fantasy. The works evoke the bones and the flesh of the body, uh, the folds of the body, the curves. I use unexpected juxtapositions to create these forms and, as I mentioned earlier, successive physical and digital processes. In my most recent body of work the last few years, I've been focusing on bones. So uh, the bones are basically my essential fragments. And I've been focusing on anatomical, their anatomical features because each bone has its own anatomy. When we think of anatomy, we usually think of the anatomy of our own bodies. But each bone has a very unique anatomy and every part of this anatomy has a very specific uh, function. And it is also distinct visually, which is very important for me. I've been scanning the bones and I've been focusing on the on their anatomical features, and using digital fabrications, I create sculptures, I create clothing and drawings based on a 3D scan of a bone's anatomy. 
So in my work, the bone becomes the body, it becomes a dress or it becomes a fashion sketch. So it's being transformed through technology, uh, my manual work, and it results in a series of narratives. So there is the physical bone that becomes digital, it becomes physical again. And throughout this process, there are several narratives that are emerging and each one of these narratives is captured in one of my artworks. Now I'd like to share some thoughts to conclude on the now what. So what are the implications of using technology to construct our digital body and our digital identities? Through the use of technology and especially 3D scanning, the body can be redesigned. The technology is available today. It works very well. So it's not something that is, you know, hundreds of years down the road. We don't have it on our phones yet. I believe it's not going to be long before we are able to do that. So once we have this this tool, this technology, and we can use it daily, we can, the body is going to be constantly conceptualized and produced as a digital body. So what is going to happen? Uh, What are the decisions we're going to make? How are we going to create this digital body? Are we going to eliminate part of ourselves? Are we going to substitute parts of ourselves? How are we going to think to define the form? What are the fragments that we're going to be uh, bringing in? Are we going to bring fragments from another human being, uh, fragments from our past, from our dreams, from our history, and how are we going to make sense of these fragments and put them together? Also, what elements are we going to use in different online platforms to create our multiple selves online? So these narratives that we will be creating are going to have distinct meaning. So this is a question that I'm very interested in because the technology is there. Very soon it will be available to all of us. So how are we we going to use this technology to present ourselves online? And what is important, I think, to keep in mind is that What 3D scanning enables us to do is to bring our three-dimensional world and make this three-dimensional world, everything in our environment, everything that matters to us, part of our digital identity and gives us give us the option to combine this with our physical body. So constructing the body will not be a decision. It's not going to be a simple photograph. Um, it's not going to be something that someone else has created. As you know, in all the platforms we're using, we have the options to create or quote-unquote avatars. Uh, we have uh, hairstyles. We have clothing. Uh, but all these are options that have been determined, uh, usually by the manufacturer, obviously, or people who do research in the area. So we have to pick and choose from what is provided to us and which, of course, is very limited. With 3D scanning, we have the option to bring our own world into the equation and to bring our own world into our identities and how we build our presence online. So there is no pre-existing content if we don't want this to be there. So with all these options, I believe we can break free from a single representation and feel very comfortable working with these variables. And This will help us, I believe, reveal our true essence because it will allow us to show what matters and uh, what matters in certain contexts. It will allow us to be more authentic simply because we can bring more into the equation than a simple photograph. And I also believe that it will be empowering because it will allow every one of us to be creative and create our digital self online instead of simply having, uh, as I said before, a photograph or simply using our pre-existing features that are available to us. So um, this concludes my talk. I look forward to your questions and I look forward to uh, our conversation. Thank you, Lilia. Um, Firstly, yeah, it's really interesting to hear you talk about this idea of like the hybridized body um, and how this can be like more empowering and authentic and kind of create new possibilities than the ones that are created for us. So I wanted to ask you, what are some ways technology could change the current way we present ourselves online? I know you've mentioned avatars, filters, what, like, what are some, some ideas that we can expand the variables? This is, of course, I believe, I think the beauty of this is that each one of us can decide what we can bring, right? And uh, what we can merge with our own bodies. Um, I think the, the key difference with what we have available today is today we have two dimensions. We have photographs and, of course, we have video. And we are able to do some basic editing. And we can also use the filters and the emojis and, you know, some additional features that we can put around our bodies. Uh, 3D scanning allows us to focus on the essence. So it is a three-dimensional physical body that can be transformed because, as I said, you can eliminate parts, you can add components, right? Or you can uh, combine all this. Uh, I will give you an example from 
one of my sculptures where I use elements. I scanned my own body, I scanned my leg, and I scanned scan my torso. I used uh, scans of body parts of a doll that I had as a child. I scanned my previous sculptures that because it was very interesting for me to see them from being transformed from an alabaster piece that I carved by hand to a piece that was digitally fabricated. And then, you know, once we ch- I changed the material, it became a totally different work. So this process of transformation, I think it's as exciting as the end quote-unquote product of how we're going to present ourselves online. But I think the possibilities are much larger than what we have today, simply because there is construction. It's not about the surface. It's about constructing. I also wanted to ask you, like, when you work with so many different materials, do you choose them specifically for certain works? Is like what is there a rationale behind the meaning of the material or even also the function of the bone? Because you mentioned that they have very specific functions. Like are you thinking about that when you're putting together the work? I have been using many different materials. It's very interesting because there is no logical reason why I choose a certain... Actually, uh, the question came up a few times recently. I don't start with the material. I think this is this part of my, my work that is very that is planned. I think a lot. I make a lot of notes. I plan. But when I work on the piece, uh, I forget all the planning. So the materials... I I experiment with a lot of material, so when I work, I can pick and choose from my experiments and see what material works best. And uh, because I've been working for quite some time, and I spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, how materials behave, how do they change when I work on them by hand, how do, do they change when I burn them, right? Or how do they change when I combine them with other materials? I sort of have this library um, of um, information, and I think it just comes and becomes part of the process. So it's not a conscious decision what material I use for everything. Mm-hmm. So it's more like a fluid process and it's kind of happening and unveiling as it's progressing. Exactly, okay. yes. Also, um, when kind of researching your work, the mat- the base material that you're working on is bones and there is like a sense of abject or morbidity in that using using bones and uh, it reminds me of terms such as memento mori which is a reminder of one's own mortality also the idea of exquisite corpse which is like a surrealism yeah. technique um, because you're creating these new associations between different fragments uh, but your work is also undoubtedly really beautiful so how are you thinking about these two things um, coming together in your work um, yeah, this is a very interesting question because I don't think of morbidity, at least not at a conscious level uh, in terms of my work. I got interested in the bones because I believe they're the essence of the body. So when I was thinking, I was going through a process, so I was thinking I'm interested in the body. How do I express it? So I was trying to see what is the essence, right? And the bones are definitely the essence of the body. This is how it started. Uh, and once I started studying them, I found them astonishingly beautiful. So I never think of morbidity when I think of bones. But definitely, I think you are right that if I step back and I look at my work, this element there, but I think it's more subconscious than actually, you know, me explicitly thinking about it when I make the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also challenging the idea that of like bones as being kind of negative, it it can also, the idea of memento mori can also bring people peace and awareness of their own human human nature. Exactly. Uh, Yes. Mm -hmm. We have a attendee who raised their hand. So I'll have have you join on stage, Mariana Ortega. Hi. Hey, I good to see you, Mariana. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it's almost a follow-up, but in this case, uh, it's a question not about the reminder of death or a memento mori, but uh, a memento vivere in a way, uh, um, in the way that are saying that you go from uh, this idea of being a regular self to a digital self and then going back and forth. And what you added in this talk that I don't, I have not seen in the work, in your work when I see it, um, is this idea of transforming our very selves while we're dealing with digital networks and having a multiplicity of selves right, as we are presenting them. I'm wondering um, what you think about the idea that 
in the movement back and forth from materials, digital, material back to digital production of multiple cells, um, how, will, how will that movement um, connect to the contradictions that might be happening within the different relations of the types of cells that we are proposing? And so hey, the question is, not only are we being reminded of death, right, as a memento mori, but the different ways we can change. But what if we encounter these deep contradictions? Will the digitalization of ourselves help us deal with them or make them even more uh, uh, that that will really get to us, right? And will show how confused about ourselves we might be. Uh, Mariana, this is a very interesting question. I have to say that I've been very inspired by Mariana Ortega's work. Uh, thank you for that and for the question. Um, I think I can only speak about my work. I think what is the answer, I think we have to do research and see how people, you know, uh, experience these environments and this transformation, you know, have them tell us. In my process of doing that, I think the the most important part is the transformation itself, because the end uh, quote-unquote product or presentation, it will only be there for a limited time, and it will only be one among others. Mm-hmm. And uh, we will never like it enough, right? We will always think that another one would be better down the road. So I think, at least to me, in my work, what matters is this process of transformation. In my most recent work that I promise to show you soon, it's again, it's the bone as lingerie and the bone becomes lace uh, and the lace is made of cement. It's not lace, it's actually cement that looks like lace. And this has been very rewarding to me because it's a transformation of the bone becoming uh, lingerie and also cement becomes lace. And I I think that's what matters to me more than, you know, the uh, quote-unquote end product. And I believe this is what uh, people are likely to find interesting, how they can transform themselves in the process and how they can have these multiple selves. Because, I, you know, even if they don't like it, they can change it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. Uh, we also have another a raised hand from Claudia Hart, so I will beam you up on stage as well. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. You too. Um, I wanted to ask um, about the images that you make, because I feel it's interesting that you're talking about avatar identity and identity in the way you construct the work in your head when you make it. In other words, we artists tell ourselves stories. We always have. And then we have the work. So there's this conceptual background. And at the end, what I see are extremely, the the images that you are putting online in this time when everything is online is not an avatar. It's a beautiful, abstract, surrealist abstraction that evokes Um, School of Paris, um, you know, um, but not exactly that because they didn't have our tools. Um, A kind of abstraction that's very voluptuous, that evokes feminine body, reminds me of French um, experimental photography from the turn of the century, like the beginning of photography, and evokes bodies, but also flowers and very beautiful things like that. So I would, I also find it interesting, it's a two part thing, that you talk about, you know, the alchemy of transformation that really interests you. So we see a kind of a transformation and alchemy that comes from the transformative process of the digital, because digital is fluid, that's its main thing, right? Is this kind of fluidity. I so that is also connected to surrealism, you know. So I myself use a lot of very, uh, you know, a lot of conceptual structures to make my work. But when you experience my work, it's irrelevant. It's the back end, the stories that I tell myself. So I'm I'm interested in hearing you talk about your relationship to surrealism and that actual fact. The your discourse about identity and avatar bodies 
and the results, which are these beautiful, semi-abstract, organic, sensual abstractions. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, for joining us, Claudia. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. I have been, you know, studying the surrealist for sure. Um, and I think what you said makes perfect sense. And um, there is a reason why I didn't use avatar, the word avatar, as part of my talk. And I usually don't use the word. Because again, when we say avatar, there are some preconceptions what an avatar is. And of course, each one of us has a slightly different preconception uh, of how the avatar should look or what the avatar should do. That's why I speak about digital bodies. What I presented today as, is, as you said, uh, my readings, my thinking, what is uh, how my work starts. And as you know, when you work as an artist, you forget what you read or what you think, and then it's just you and the work. Uh, but of course, uh, I'm the one who is doing the research and I'm the one who is making the work, so there should be some connection. And my work really points out to the fact that avatars or digital identities can be anything. It doesn't have to be what we're used to see or what others have provided us. Because now if I want to construct an avatar using my phone or using, you know, some other platform, the options are very limited. So I can only do so much. Or uh, I'm not into video games, but you can, when you play video games, you can have certain characters with certain forms. And okay, maybe I can add the, you know, the wings of a bird or something like that. Again, the options are very limited. So my work speaks exactly to that, that I don't have to go with the limited options that are provided to me by a certain platform or a manufacturer or even another artist. And I don't have to use... Uh, to go with the preconceptions of what is an avatar or what is my digital self. I can make, make my own, and uh, the way I make them my own is um, I'm interested in the bones, so I transform the bones for the reasons I mentioned, or I use my own body, or I use my childhood doll, and so on. In that way, it's like, isn't art an avatar? Like, art is the ultimate avatar. and. I, I, there's also the words that are used in the digital art scene about calling everything liminal. And I often think the same thing, like, isn't art liminal? The art itself is this sort of halfway zone. And you can definitely see your interest in bodies and your own body and femininity within these beautiful abstract organic spaces. You know, I like the documents. The documents stand on their own, I feel. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks for joining us. So we have also another question in the Q&A from Susan Broussard. I'll read it out. Lilia, your figurative approach is beautiful, unique, and exciting. Two questions. Do you consider yourself a figurative artist, or have you ever been an artist drawing or painting with figurative models? Uh, I work with models. I haven't painted with models. I sculpted with models. So a long time ago, I took classes uh, to learn uh, anatomy. This is why I sculpted with models. That was my main my main goal. I don't work at all with uh, outside uh, stimuli in the sense I cannot, even when I was working, my focus was on the anatomy to, because you have to work with, you know, with the skeleton and you have to work with the uh, with real bodies to uh, learn anatomy. But I don't get inspired by looking at something and try to replicate and I never worked that way Sarah Lynn Roberts I'll read out your question around the limitations of this construction when you consider alchemy it's uh, taking elements and transforming them into something but you have to have the raw materials first do you ever feel limited by your own lived body or your preconception of yourself no because uh, you know, I go to the studio, I work every day. Obviously, there are good days, there are bad days. But I think I always have more ideas than I can actually, you know, work with. Mm -hmm. Because I've been working with this for some time and I'm very interested. And I think, uh, as I said before, uh, I believe the technology gives you many options, not only in terms of what we make, but most importantly, on how we think and what we think. I think this gives you a lot of freedom and a lot of ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or I saw your... A message when I first posted the question that you're interested in the glitched result and I'd love to hear a little more about that if you're willing to join us. Uh, as I said to Lily, I'm really happy to finally meet you and, and obviously listen to your talk about your work. 
Yeah, my, my entire experience is with glitches. So obviously when scanning, um, and I've scanned um, in my life, I'm very much imperfections and, and how things just don't turn out the way you think they are. And, and either with scanning or with 3D printing, I love it when the printer is going completely bonkers and you just end up with lots of curls and plastic burns and when trying to scan something, especially when, when it comes out to your body, trying to duplicate something that you know so well, especially if you do it yourself, and it never does because you cannot do the entire move or the range. I'm really interested in the in the outcomes of that mm -hmm. because I just, I just love that. Have you um, heard of the new book that came out, Glitch Feminism? Of course. Yeah, of course. I have, already have it. I have it on uh, as an ebook, but I haven't read it yet. But I'm I listened to one of Legacy Russell's talks about how the the glitch has potential for it's not an error, but it's a potential for something more. I mean, glitches and glitches in art have been have been here for since the '60s, and maybe before that, we in print and everything, and it becomes such a big thing now. And I've been doing glitches for two years now, and I love it. And at some point, you just learn what to expect and how to expect. Um, what, what to do is you get a specific result, which is no longer a glitch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is quite interesting mm -hmm. in, in terms of history and, and how you go back to it. Do you, like, intentionally so, yeah. make glitches, or do they just appear on its yeah. own? I, I work with glitches. I mm -hmm. work with glitches in, in everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I create them. I know how to create them. There are sometimes happy accidents. Mm -hmm. But then again, you learn what you've done and then you can repeat it and it's no longer a glitch. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is my thing, imperfections. But this happens with uh, physical materials as well. But I believe we talk less about it for some reason, yeah. which is now that I'm thinking it's interesting. I don't know why, but it happens. It's exactly, yeah, it's exactly as you said, or that once you uh, decide to incorporate this into your work because it's in a way or another interesting, and then you can replicate, then it becomes something else, right? Um, but I think the process is very yeah. similar, physical and digital, in terms of that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It happens in everything. It happens. It happens in speech, it happens in thought, visual language, physical language. It, it happens when we walk, when we communicate. So if you want to look at it like in, in terms of acquiring skills, bodily skills, you can look at babies, how they develop, how they acquire skills. And it's the same, it's the same thing. Yeah, I totally agree with, with what you say, Lilia. Well, thank you so much for your talk and conversation. Thank you, Lilia, for uh, raising interesting questions. Katie, thanks so much. And thank you, thank you. It's been so nice like getting to speak with you about your work and getting to know you. I hope we can meet in person soon. Yeah, thank <laughs> you.